Welcome to the weird world of the very, very small. So what I'm going to be talking about is trying to give you a sense of scale in the sense of talking you down from the sort of scale that we're used to down to the scale we're talking about, where quantum mechanics ultimately becomes dominant. So we're going to be going from meters down to nanometers. And we'll have a think about a sense of symmetry, which is how physicists tend to think about how do we know what's going on inside, for, insti for instance, inside a piece of matter? How do we know what's going on inside? We use this concept of symmetry. And we'll finish with a description of the quantum world, some of the bizarre results that we get when we think about the quantum world. And we'll think about some of the applications, including how we go about seeing individual atoms. So that's what we're going to be doing. So I think we're all familiar with the world on a scale of meters down to millimeters or so. So our friend here is on a scale of a few millimeters. And if we go down smaller, perhaps you recognize a structure like this. This is of order uh, a tenth of a meter, a millimeter, or perhaps a twentieth of a millimeter. So this is a pollen grain. And its diameter in this particular case would be, let's say, one twentieth of a millimeter. So that's 50 microns, a micron being one thousandth of a millimeter. And of course, we can go down uh, beyond that. Excuse me, let me just get rid of a panel that's just thrown up there. OK, uh, we can go down to smaller scales uh, in terms of mechanics. We can go down to building things on scales that are substantially smaller than uh, a millimeter. For instance, this particular sort of cog and ratchet set. But of course, that's not the limit to what we can actually construct in terms of miniaturization, because as I'm sure you're all aware, when we get down to electronics and microchips, we can get down to tiny, tiny areas. For instance, a square millimeter of the, uh, of, of the central chip that's inside your computer or your laptop or your tablet or your phone, whatever it is you're using, every square millimeter of your silicon chip will contain millions, if not tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of transistors. So that means the size of individual components in a computer chip might only be of order nanometers or probably tens of nanometers. So a nanometer is one thousandth of a micron, a micron is one thousandth of a millimeter, and we all know what millimeters are. So we can see that we're already on an industrial scale, getting down to the size of, well, we have to understand what the world is made of if we're trying to manufacture um, objects, transistors in this case, which are only tens of nanometers in size. So we ask ourselves the question, what is the world made of? What is matter made of when we get down to very small scales? Uh, in other words, how can we tell? We can ask the question, but how can we actually tell what the world is made of? What clues do we have as scientists to tell us what the world is made of? So Aristotle had his own ideas. He said, well, the world is made of earth, air, fire and water, which is, well, that's one model that you can use, not quite the modern version, but that's one way of thinking of how you combine fire, air, earth and water in various combinations to account for everything that we can see. But rather than say that's what we think the world is made of, Galileo said, well, we shouldn't simply think what it might be made of. We should ask ourselves about experiments. We should observe and we should quantify things using quantitative experiments, not use simple intellectual arguments of logic as to how we think things should behave. So we should do quantitative experiments rather than simply rely on qualitative intellectual arguments. In other words, a, a paraphrasing of that, rather than saying what should happen if we let go of an object or what happens if we try cutting an object in half and then in half again and then in half again, rather than asking ourselves what we think ought to happen, let's ask ourselves what actually happens. Let's do an experiment and find out rather than just hypothesize in the intellectual sense. And by the time Newton came along, he was effectively the master of doing this. And so we end up with Newtonian laws of motion, law of gravity, 
the nature of light, which he uh, did a number of experiments on, and what we now call classical mechanics to distinguish it from what we now know as quantum mechanics. So classical mechanics basically was everything up to the time of Newton. And hence we refer to this as Newtonian mechanics or Newtonian motion or Newtonian gravity. So as of the 1600s, it looked like the world was in great shape, thanks to this wonderful Englishman who did so much work in telling us about how things move, how things fall under the influence of gravity and the nature of light. So it looked like the universe was clockwork. It looked like everything ran according to Newton's laws of motion. If you push something, it keeps moving until you push on it with another force, etc. Uh, if you let go, of an object, it will continue moving until you stop it. And there's, thus, if you've got, for instance, the solar system, then once the solar system is in motion, it will stay in motion. You don't need a driving force to keep pushing Jupiter around in its orbit. Much like a clock, once you've got a working system, it will work in much the same way that a clock works, okay? Maybe a clock needs to be wound up now and again, but effectively it looks like everything in the universe is just deterministic. Once you know where everything is, you can use Newton's laws of motion to figure out where it will be in one second time, in a year's time, in a million years time. And if it comes to wanting to understand what's going on in matter, we can use symmetry, we can use the shape of objects. So for instance, if we look at snowflakes, it looks like every snowflake we put under the microscope seems to have a certain pattern. It seems to have a certain six-fold symmetry. So surely that's telling us something about what a snowflake is made of. We can use that argument before we start dissecting a snowflake to see what's inside. We can come to the conclusion that surely whatever is inside a snowflake must have that sort of symmetry in order to produce something that has this sort of symmetry. And we can use that argument more generally if we look at this particular metal. This appears to be a piece of bismuth, according to the little label behind it. If atoms, sorry, if the structure, the internal structure, I shouldn't say atoms yet, of course we're going to come to the conclusion that the world is made of atoms, but whatever's going on inside this metal, it's producing, uh, it's producing these particular shapes, and so we have to be able to explain what are the building blocks that make this metal want to adopt this particular set of shapes. And similarly, when we look at other structures, we say, well, if this particular metal wants to crystallize in what appears to be these cubic shapes, that tells us something about what this metal must be made of. Maybe this metal is made of lots of smaller cubes, and that's why we get um, a metal crystallizing into this particular shape. But then we also have to explain the fact that some crystals don't adopt cubic shapes, they adopt shapes like this dodecahedron. What is it that's going on inside this material that makes it want to adopt that particular shape? The argument is that the macroscopic shape that we can see with our eyes and the symmetry that we can deduce from the crystals by simply looking at them, that must be telling us something about the underlying structure of whatever makes up this metal or that crystal or any other material that we care to look at. So I'm not going to turn this into a history lesson, but there have been a lot of key players who have asked the question, what is the world made of and how can we understand, if you like, the nature of matter? So we could, if we wish, start with Democritus. Uh, this timeline goes from 1600 to 1900, but clearly Democritus is way over on the left-hand side, outside the scope of this particular scale. So Democritus came up with the argument that maybe you can't keep subdividing materials as many times as you like. Maybe there's a fundamental unit, a fundamental building block, which can't be divided, a so-called indivisible, an atom. And during the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, a lot of people uh, worked on this idea using chemistry and other uh, sciences to try and figure out what must the world be made of in order to give us all the properties that we can deduce. There's a number of players in this particular screen. You can see seven individuals. I'll give you a second just to have a look at their faces. Perhaps you can put names to the faces. Some of them perhaps yes, some of them perhaps no. Let's just put the names there starting from the left. We have Boyle, then I'm sure you recognize Newton, 
And then Lavoisier, then we have Dalton, Avogadro, Maxwell, and Boltzmann. So I'm not going to go through all of their contributions, but each of these scientists had a part to play in trying to answer the question, what is the world made of? And if we jump to the 1800s and 1900s, there are a number of other players, but I'm just going to concentrate on two. And again, you may recognize the faces, you may not. We have here Young, as in Young Slits, who did experiments with light waves, passed light through slits and showed that they interfered with each other, showing that light is a wave. And on the right here in the late 1800s, we have Thomson, J.J. Thomson, who showed that electrons are particles. So electrons that have been known about in the sense of cathode rays for quite some time, but it wasn't clear whether a cathode ray was a wave or a particle. Thompson showed that these negatively charged objects, which we now call electrons, are particles. So as of the 19th century, by 1900, it looked like things were reasonably wrapped up. We knew all about Newton's equations of motion and Newton told us how the world works. And Young had told us that light is a wave and Thompson had told us that certain objects that we've known about, electrons, they seem to make up a lot of matter, maybe not all of it. Electrons are negatively charged, so presumably there are other objects that are positively charged that also make up the building blocks of all matter. But at least we've got things nailed down. We've got Newton's laws of motion, and we know that light is a wave and an electron is a particle. Everything looked rosy. But as of the 20th century, that let the cat out of the bag and everything then changed. Here, you notice I'm not showing the timeline of the entire century. This is just the first 30 years and there are already a number of key players who started to change our vision of how the world works. Again, I'll let you look at the uh, faces for a while there. And then we'll start putting names to the faces. Again, some you probably know, some you might not. So early on, just in the late part of the 1800s, we have Becquerel. Then we have Planck, Rutherford, of course, Einstein, everybody would recognize him, I'm sure. Niels Bohr, De Broglie, who probably you don't recognize. And then we have the key architects of quantum mechanics, Heisenberg and Schrodinger. So what is it that happens during those three decades in the early part of the 20th century? Well, a lot was pinned down from the early concepts that electrons must be negatively charged particles. Then we started to build up the idea of atoms must be a combination of electrons, which are negatively charged and uh, other positively charged particles. So back in the early part of 1800s, we have radioactivity. Planck told us that light is actually particles. Rutherford enables us to determine the existence of atoms and atomic nuclei. By the 1920s, we're talking about probability being a key player in how we look at matter. And de Broglie in the 1920s is now talking about electrons as waves. So before we get onto the right hand side and talk about quantum mechanics, notice that we've completely overturned what we said before, where we determined that from Young's experiments, light was a wave, and from Thomson's experiments, electrons are particles. Now we have exactly the opposite. Now we have light is a particle, according to Planck and Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect, which got him the Nobel Prize. And here we've got another upstart de Broglie saying electrons behave like waves. So you can see the amount of confusion that reigned in the early part of the 20th century, because it looks like light is a particle and a wave. And it looks like what we thought of as particles, electrons, are particles and waves. So we have this rather crazy so-called wave-particle duality. We can't actually say whether matter or light is a wave or is a particle. They seem to behave, depending on which day of the week you happen to choose, they sometimes behave like particles and sometimes behave like waves. And it was these two architects on the right-hand side, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, who pulled all of these strands together. 
and said, look, this is the way we have to look at the world. We can't just have this rather nebulous idea that maybe uh, light is a particle and maybe it's a wave and maybe electrons are particles and maybe they're a wave. We have to have a unified way of looking at matter at this scale when we're talking about the very, very small, the scale of order nanometers or so. And they built this architecture, which we now call quantum mechanics. Quantum, because of the nature of how we go about building the universe. We don't build it in the way Newton would envisage. We build it according to a completely different set of rules. So we have this picture in our heads, I'm sure. Um, this has reinforced everything from early, um, early textbooks up to modern university teaching. We have this sort of picture of what an atom should be. It's some positively charged particles in the middle of the atom, and there's a whole load of negatively charged electrons buzzing around in these little orbits. And although that's not quite true, that's still comforting in that it gives us an idea of what's actually going on. The nucleus is just sitting there and the electrons appear to be in motion. But it's not quite right because in quantum mechanics, unlike Newtonian mechanics, we can't think of electrons orbiting like the Earth orbits the Sun. That's not quite the right picture uh, to help us understand how atoms work. The other problem with this particular picture, it doesn't tell us that all of these electrons actually have different energies. If we were to measure the energy of various electrons with an atom, we don't find they're all the same. If we look at this picture, all the electrons seem to be behaving the same way. But in fact, when we actually measure the electron energy, we find they all have different energies. So that picture doesn't really work. And a slightly better picture is to think of them in different orbits. So again, we have this problem that we tend to think of electrons orbiting around the nucleus like the Earth orbits around the Sun. And that's not quite the right analogy. But this at least shows us that all the electrons here are at different distances from the nucleus, the big red blob in the middle there. And they all have particular orbits. They can't have any old orbit they like. They can't simply decide to be any distance from the nucleus. They must be this distance or this distance or this distance. In other words, the arrangement of electrons in an atom is quantized. Strictly speaking, it's actually the angular momentum that's quantized, but that results in the distances being quantized and the energy of the electrons being quantized. That's why electrons have particular energy levels rather than simply have any energy they like within an atom. So this little picture up here makes it look like a solar system. It makes it look like a flat disk. We should think about it more as being a three dimensional object and hence the uh, the electrons that we show as rings in this top little picture, perhaps they should be more like shells. And you can see this shell has been cut open to reveal the sort of Russian doll idea of there's a shell of electrons and outside that another shell, outside that another shell, outside that another shell. So it's not quite right, but it's a reasonable way of thinking about the way electrons are arranged in atoms. And the real power of this particular idea is the fact that we have particular numbers of electrons. You can see here there's two electrons in this orbit. That's not arbitrary. We can't simply um, put uh, five electrons in that particular orbit all going around at the same distance from the nucleus. There are certain rules in quantum mechanics that say you can only build an atom by putting the electrons in to these shells in a particular way. And that idea of shells of electrons ultimately gives us the idea of the periodic table. And of course, sorting elements according to their properties is something that happened before we understood why they had those particular properties. But Mendeleev started taking all the elements that were known and arranging them according to their common properties and started to see this periodicity that this metal looks similar to another metal um, that is heavier by 18 units or 36 units or whatever it happens to be.
And building up this picture, we got this idea of periodicity, which fed into our understanding of that's why we get the periodicity, because if we build an atom in this way, with electrons that are in these particular structures, then we can show why it is that iron has this particular property and why uh, this element like carbon or ni uh, nitrogen or oxygen, whatever it might be, that's why they have the properties they have, that's why they have the physical properties, or indeed the chemical properties, or the magnetic properties, these all are a consequence of how the electrons are arranged in an atom. And ultimately, that's dictated by the rules of this quantum mechanical um, construct, this arrangement of, if you like, mathematics that says this is how atoms behave. So we are still tempted to say, well, if electrons are in these orbits in an atom, is the sun like the nucleus and the electrons are like the planets going round at different distances? Well, only superficially in the sense that uh, in principle, Jupiter could be any distance from the sun. It just happens to be that distance in our solar system. But in atoms, the atoms do not have a choice. In an atom of carbon, the uh, electrons have to be in a particular structure, and it's the same for that atom of carbon as it is for that atom of carbon, as it is for an atom of carbon that is in a different solar system, or an atom of carbon on the other side of the universe. They all have to obey the same rules. Whereas we don't have to have a Jupiter at a particular distance from the sun in a different solar system. It's rather arbitrary how a solar system is put together. So thinking about an atom and a solar system, again, is a little bit misleading. Thinking about electrons like satellites and saying, well, electrons buzzing around in an atom are just like uh, GPS satellites buzzing around the Earth. Again, not strictly speaking true, because what we learn from quantum mechanics when we start to say, well, how are atoms constructed? We can't put as many satellites in orbit as we like. We've chosen to put 24 satellites in orbits for the GPS system. We could have chosen 48 if we wished. We don't have that choice with atoms. We can't simply put electrons where we like in order to build ourselves an atom. The other fundamental difference is what came out, uh, which I skipped through very quickly earlier, was the fact that in the middle of the 20th century, it was realized that we can't talk about atoms in the same deterministic way that we do when we're talking about Newtonian mechanics. If we're looking at a snooker ball moving on a table, then if we know what forces are acting on that snooker ball, we can predict which way the snooker ball is going to move. But when it comes to quantum mechanics, one of the fundamental tenets of quantum mechanics is that the behavior of, well, essentially everything, is dictated by probability. We cannot say what is going to happen. We can only say the probability of something happening. If we want to know, is an electron at this particular position, at this particular distance from the nucleus, we cannot answer that question. We can only say, what's the probability that it's at this position, or that position, or this position? And so we could think about electrons not as being objects that are orbiting a nucleus. We can think of them as, if you like, clouds. And we can say, here's a few pictures of clouds, uh, clouds in not in the terrestrial sense, but clouds in the sense that if, uh, for instance, this point here, which is where the, uh, the nucleus would sit in the center of this cloud, then how bright this cloud looks tells us how likely it is that there's an electron at this particular position relative to the nucleus. And so instead of talking about electrons that are in this orbit around the nucleus or this orbit or that orbit, we talk, that we talk about them being part of this cloud or that cloud. And you can see that these clouds have different shapes, telling us that the probability that an electron is at a certain position in the atom is dependent on which particular cloud we're talking about. And even then, we cannot determine where an electron is. We can all only talk about where it is likely to be. And this is a fundamental shift from what Newton said, where we can calculate anything we like, it's all determined by the laws of Newton. Now we have to flip a coin and say, well, we don't know where the 
particle is, the electron is going to be, we can work out the probability it's here or the probability it's there. And that is a fundamentally different shift in the way we think about the world. Because the world that we see up here on the scale of a meter doesn't seem to behave that way. If I take this pen and I let go, it drops. It's not a question of maybe it drops and maybe it doesn't. It always drops. It's as if things on the big scale, on the macroscopic scale, seem to behave differently than atoms on the microscopic scale. And understanding why that should be is part of the fundamental problem. And that's why it's taken many years for quantum mechanics to bed itself into science. Part of the problem with dealing with atoms is the fact, how do we describe an atom? Do we use words? And do we use words like particles and waves? I've already used those. And do we use words like orbits? We've said, are the ways that electrons behave in an atom, are they the same as the way the Earth orbits the sun, for instance? If we talk about spin, this is a particular property of, of particles, such as electrons. Um, and is, are we talking about the same thing as when we're talking about the Earth spinning on its axis? And that's part of the problem. We're using words, but we're using words from English which already have a meaning, and we're trying to use those words to describe atoms. And I'll say something about that on the next slide. So we always have this option of saying we can describe an atom by simply describing what it is that's actually going on inside an atom. But alternatively, we can try and set up a picture of an atom, as we have done on the last few slides. We know that the picture of electrons buzzing around a nucleus is not a particularly good picture. Maybe a better picture is to think about these clouds of electrons that have a certain probability of being in certain positions around the atom. But that's not quite right either, because we know that ultimately, what is determining how an atom behaves is absolutely fundamentally the laws of probability. And that means maths. I hate to say it, but I'm sorry. Maths is the only fundamental way of dealing with a description of what's going on at the quantum level, at the level of molecules and atoms and particles and smaller. So we could write an equation that looks ridiculously simple there, h psi equals e psi, looks like a very simple equation, but actually it's one of these equations where the individual elements, the individual symbols in this particular equation actually hide an awful, an awful lot of complexity. So maths is really the only way we can actually calculate anything at the quantum scale, but in order to talk to each other we need to use words, and humans, generally speaking, like to engage the visual cortex, so we like to use pictures as well. So we try and use words, we use pictures, but ultimately we need maths to tell us what is actually going on and to enable us to calculate what would happen if we did this to an atom, what would happen? If we had this atom, what properties should it have? If we combine these atoms together into a molecule or into a crystal, what properties would that be expected to have? The maths tells us the answer, the words is how we communicate with each other, and the pictures sometimes help us visualize what's going on. But sometimes the visualization simply doesn't work because we don't comprehend how we go from the maths to a picture. In terms of the words, well, that sometimes just gets in the way. We wish to talk about the structure of atoms, says Heisenberg, one of the architects of quantum mechanics. But we cannot talk about atoms in ordinary language. If we attempt to say, what does an atom look like if we look inside it, we try and use words that we understand, but the problem is those words come with baggage and preconceptions. So we could say, for instance, uh, an electron orbits and spins in the atom, or the electrons in the plural, they orbit around the nucleus and they spin within the atom. But using the word orbit and spin makes us think about the way the Earth goes around the sun and the way the Earth spins on its axis. And that's not what we mean when we're talking about the electrons in an atom. So you could say that we really shouldn't use those words because those words make us think of something which is actually incorrect when we're trying to apply it to atoms. 
So rather than talk about electrons orbiting and spinning in the atom, maybe we should have started with the slithy toes did Gaia and Gimbal in the wave. That carries exactly the same amount of information. You may think that's gibberish and surely orbiting and spinning makes much more sense, but only because we think of the Earth orbiting and spinning. And that's not what we're trying to get across when we're talking about the structure of atoms. So maybe we shouldn't reuse the same words for a different purpose. But it's too late. We've had quantum mechanics for 100 years now, since the 1930s or so, late 20s, early 30s. And we've been using those words for the last hundred years, and it's now impossible to stop using those words and say, this is confusing, let's use a different set of words that refer to the way atoms behave, and not, let's not pretend that they actually are behaving the same way as planets in the solar system. So that was a choice that was made a hundred years ago, and that is the source of confusion. That's one of the big sources of confusion whenever you try and describe quantum mechanics to people is you're using the wrong vocabulary because you're using words where people think they know what those words mean, but they're being used in a different context, and those preconceptions don't really help. Or came up with this wonderful statement, Everything that we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. That is a very deep statement. So as far as we're concerned, I'm real, you're real. The table I'm sitting in front of appears to be real, but it appears to be made of things which are very ghostly and don't seem to have any reality at all in the sense that we can describe them mathematically. They seem to behave according to a rules of probability, but they don't seem to be concrete objects in their own right. And this, of course, causes us a problem. We're used to the idea that we can perceive the world and we perceive the world according to the things literally that we can perceive on a scale of millimeters up to meters up to kilometers. But trying to imagine what things look like on the much smaller scale gives us a problem. Schrodinger, the, the other mechanic of quantum mechanics, said, atomic physics has shown us that atoms have no meaning, but can only be understood in experimental measurement. Again, that's a pretty amazing statement for anybody to make. Atoms have no meaning. You can think of that as being, well, atoms are a convenient way of thinking about the way the world is made but his argument was the only thing that actually matters is if you do an experiment, what answer do you get? If you make a measurement, what answer do you get? If you want to know if a chemical reacts with another chemical, what answer do you get? It doesn't matter what an atom actually is. It doesn't matter whether you can visualize it or not. That's irrelevant. All that matters is if you try and predict what you would get if you did a particular experiment, can you predict what the answer would be? If you can predict the answer, then your basis of your scientific method is sound. If you have a model or a theory, if you prefer, that says this is how I think atoms are built and using that particular model, I can predict that this particular metal should have this particular magnetic property, then that sounds like a very good model. Just because you can't make sense of what that atom is doing is irrelevant. If you can't make sense of it, that's a limitation of the way our brains are wired. The human brain is the result of half a million years of evolution based on where's the next meal coming from and can I avoid getting eaten? Our brains are not wired to understand things like quantum mechanics, what an atom looks like, or indeed what's going on inside a black hole. Our brains are simply not wired the right way. Maybe in another half million years, we will evolve to deal with this. But we've only been thinking about quantum mechanics for the last hundred years. And that's not long enough to change the way our brains work. I don't like it, and I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. Again, for one of the architects of quantum mechanics, that's a very damning statement. He was never entirely comfortable with what his own theory was telling him. Quantum mechanics does not seem to make sense in various situations. 
even though it tends to produce the results that agree with experiment, when you ask what's going on inside an atom or a molecule, sometimes the answers don't seem to make any sense whatsoever. And most people, as a gut feeling, prefer to deal with theories that make sense. And Schrodinger was never entirely comfortable with his own theory. If we think about quantum mechanics versus common sense, here's some of the rather bizarre things that quantum mechanics comes up with. Atoms, or indeed any particle, so this is anything made of atoms, are unpredictable. So in other words, we can only know the probability of something happening. We can only know the probability of an atom having a particular position or a particular speed or a particular energy or any particular property you want to think of. We can only talk about the probability of something existing. We can never talk about absolutes. So that's one area where common sense deviates from what quantum mechanics says. We think about atoms as being small because we're talking about what is stuff made of and presumably what stuff is made of has to be tiny because we can't see it therefore atoms have to be absolutely tiny presumably uh, smaller than nanometers or so but strictly speaking according to quantum mechanics because of this statement that we've just made that we can only know the probability of a particle being in a particular place we can't talk about an atom being small because the electrons that are in an atom, in principle, could be anywhere. There's a very high probability that the electron is going to be close to the nucleus. If we were to ever measure where is this electron at this instant of time, we might find that it's fairly close to the nucleus. But we might find it's 100 nanometers away, or a millimeter away, or it might be in Australia. The probability of it being a long way from the nucleus is quite low, but the probability, strictly speaking, never goes to zero. So we can't really talk about the atom being this big because there's no chance whatsoever that any of its electrons are any further away than this particular size. So although we tend to think of atoms as being small, what we mean is that there's a 99.9% .9 probability that most of the electrons are within this particular sphere that I can define, which is relatively small. That doesn't mean that everything in the atom necessarily is contained inside that sphere of a given volume. So our gut feeling, again, is completely at odds with what actually is going on in quantum mechanics. And this one causes us quite a bit of a problem. Atoms can be in two states at the same time. For instance, if we think of an electron spinning, like the Earth spinning on its axis, not a particularly good analogy, but let's go with it for the time being. If we think of an electron spinning, an electron can spin clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time. Now, of course, the Earth can't do that. The Earth seems to spin in one direction. As seen from above the North Pole, it seems to spin anti-clockwise. We never get a situation where we take a photograph of the Earth and lo and behold, we suddenly find it spinning in the other direction. But no, an electron can spin both ways at the same time. If we ask which way is it spinning, we'll get one answer or the other answer if we try and make a measurement. But at any given instant, it can be spinning in both directions at the same time. Completely and utterly counterintuitive. It does not agree in any way, shape or form with what we would call common sense. And Einstein said that's because common sense is the collection of prejudices acquired by the age of 18. In other words, if quantum mechanics disagrees with common sense, common sense is wrong. Quantum mechanics appears to give us the right answer, and common sense is simply the set, set of prejudices that we have built up by looking at the world on a much bigger scale than the scale that usually is dominated by quantum mechanics. So this idea of heads and tails, that everything is determined by probability, it's like saying that a coin is heads and tails at the same time. We know that uh, in flight, uh, a coin might be spinning very rapidly from heads to tails to heads to tails, but in quantum mechanics, it can be both at the same time. Einstein was never very happy with this idea of quantum mechanics. Einstein made fantastic inroads into general relativity and looking at the way matter 
distort space and time, but he never liked the idea of what quantum mechanics was doing on a small scale. God does not play dice, he said. God is subtle, but he is not malicious. Bohr disagreed. Stop telling God what to do, he said. Basically, that's the way the universe is built. The universe is built according to the laws of quantum mechanics. The laws of quantum mechanics are based on probability. That's the way it is. Some people accepted that. Some people, like Einstein, didn't accept it and never really were comfortable with the idea. Let me look at three aspects of quantum mechanics. The fact that order matters, let's look at Schrodinger's cat and let's see how quantum mechanics can allow us to actually see atoms. I'm not gonna go into the maths, but just to introduce to anybody that's interested, when we're taking numbers, if we multiply two numbers A and B together, it doesn't matter whether we take A times B or B times A. In other words, two times three is the same as three times two we get the same answer, six. The order in which we do the multiplication doesn't matter. It's, it's the same for addition. Two plus three is the same as three plus two. But the key problem here, or the key difference, is that in quantum mechanics, when we think about A times B, in the maths that we need for quantum mechanics, A times B is not the same as B times A. In quantum mechanics, the A and the B represent a measurement we could possibly make. Maybe we want to make a measurement of some property of this atom or molecule, and then we want to measure a different property of this atom or molecule. And the order in which we make those measurements actually makes a difference. And that is rather bizarre. So let me give you an example of if the quantum mechanics rules applied on a much larger scale. Let's imagine we have a situation where we had four animals in our menagerie, and let's take two carnivores and two vegetarians. So we have two carnivores, a lion and a vulture, and we have two vegetarians, a water buck eating some grass there and an ostrich. Not only could we divide these four animals into carnivores and vegetarians, but also we could divide them a different way. We can divide them into animals that have got four legs and animals that have got wings. On the left, we have a lion and a water buck, both of whom have four legs. And on the right, we have two animals that have wings, the vulture and the ostrich. So what? Okay, let's do an experiment in which we're trying to pick animals out of this set of four. Let's pick two out of the four. Let's, for instance, pick first the vegetarians. So we're gonna pick the two vegetarians. So we've now picked the water buck and the, and the ostrich. Now we're gonna make a second pick. We're gonna pick again. This time we're going to pick from these, we're going to pick the four-legged animals. So what we would expect to happen in classical mechanics is having decided that we're picking up the vegetarians, we're now gonna pick out the four-legged animals. So we would expect to be left with the water buck. In an equivalent quantum mechanical experiment, if we pick out the vegetarians and then we pick out the four-legged animals, what we end up with is the water buck, as we would expect, but also the lion which we had already ruled out because we had already ruled that out at the first stage of only picking the vegetarians. It's like our choice of four-legged animals has overruled the fact that we've already picked the vegetarians. So we don't get the result we would expect. Not only that, but if we picked in a different order, we get a different result. Now, if we pick first the four-legged animals, so we pick from our set of four, the four-legged animals, so we've picked the lion and the water buck, and from this, we're then gonna pick the vegetarians. So we would now expect to get the water buck. But what we actually find in quantum mechanics is when we make the second decision, we end up with a water buck and an ostrich. Again, it's as if the decision of picking out the vegetarians has overruled the earlier decision of picking out the four-legged animals. The order matters. So if we want to measure two things, if we want to look at this atom and measure its position and measure how fast it's going, we'll get a different result than if we measured how fast it's going and where it is. 
Now, in classical mechanics, it doesn't matter a damn. If you want to know something, you measure it, and measuring something else doesn't necessarily interfere with your first measurement. But here, the act of making a measurement interferes with the system and gives you a result which you're not necessarily expecting. Perhaps you've heard of Schrodinger's cat, but it's in many cases misinterpreted. So what we have in Schrodinger's cat, there's Schrodinger at the top, and there's his rather nervous looking cat in a box. The cat is placed in a box and the box is sealed. And then depending on a random event, for instance, uh, the decay of a radioactive particle, which has a 50-50 chance of happening, then if the particle decays, then uh, in this particular case, a rather frightening looking robot there, grabs a hammer, smashes a vial full of poison and the cat dies. The other 50% chance is that the radioactive particle doesn't decay, in which case the, poison is not, uh, the poisonous flask is not smashed and the cat lives. So there's a 50-50 chance of the cat dying and the cat living. The question about Schrodinger's cat is, what state is the cat in before you open the box to find out what the result of the experiment was? That is the key point about Schrodinger's cat. Before you open the box, is the cat dead or is the cat alive? You would normally say, well, it's one or the other, but we don't know which it is until we open the box. But inside the box, there's either a live cat or a dead cat. That is not what, uh, what uh, quantum mechanics says. Quantum mechanics says that when we're dealing with Schrodinger's cat, before the box is opened, the cat is both dead and alive. It is in both states. Again, completely and utterly different to what our common sense tells us. That's because we never see a cat which is half dead and half alive. That's because we only ever see a cat, if you like, after the box has been opened. Once the box is opened, the cat is one or the other. But before we make the observation, before we make the measurement, before we do the science, if you like, then quantum mechanics says that the state of the cat is, if you like, half dead, half alive. So it's not simply a question of saying we don't yet know. It is not saying that. It's saying the state of the cat is a very peculiar quantum mechanical state, which is only resolved into what we would call common sense once we actually make the measurement. That is a really, really weird thing to say, but that's apparently how quantum mechanics works. If quantum mechanics comes up with all of these really weird things about electrons spinning in both directions at the same time, cats are dead and alive, we don't know how big an atom is, if it's coming up with all of these nonsensical things, why do we believe quantum mechanics? Okay, it's been around 100 years, but so what? Well, the bottom line is, after 100 years, nothing has proved it wrong. It produces some rather bizarre predictions. It produces some rather uh, bizarre ideas. And sometimes we find it very difficult to imagine what a particle or an atom or a molecule look like. But that's uh, simply a limitation of our brains. It's not telling us that quantum mechanics has got something wrong with it. It's simply telling us that our brains are not quite capable of imagining what it is that quantum mechanics is telling us. Nothing has proved it wrong, a bit like Einstein's general relativity. And after a hundred years, if nothing has proved it wrong, that doesn't mean it's right, but it does sound like there must be some validity in what this theory is telling us. Otherwise, surely by now, we would have found some chinks in the armor and found something that's wrong. Quantum mechanics predicts various results that we can verify with experimental measurement. And it predicts things that are impossible by classical mechanics, but are possible according to quantum mechanics. And we find that they do exist. So there are some things that we have observed that simply cannot be explained by Newtonian's classic, uh, Newton's classical mechanics. Newtonian mechanics has some gaps, which if you like, quantum mechanics fills. And one way we know that quantum mechanics appears to be right is that we can use quantum mechanics to build ourselves a microscope that can see atoms. 
So let me describe to you such a microscope. It's called a scanning tunneling microscope or an STM. What if we take a slab of material, let's say a metal or a semiconductor or something like that, and let's imagine that um, we're looking at it such that we can see individual atoms. So we've got a slab of material here made up of blue atoms. And above it, we've got this tip. Imagine it as an upside down pyramid, if you like, made of these red atoms. And let's con collect, um, connect this tip to this metal slab using a wire with a, volt, a voltage being applied and an ammeter to measure how much current is flowing. Now, we know by looking at this as a circuit, if there's a break in the circuit, then no current will flow. The ammeter will show zero if the circuit is not closed. If we were to touch the sharp tip to the sample, then a current would flow depending on how big that voltage was. But that's not what we find with quantum mechanics. What we actually find is that a current flows even though there's a gap indicated here by the distance d between the two. Somehow electrons manage to find their way from one material to the other. There's no real evidence that they ever exist in the gap between them, but an electron that we thought was in the tip finds itself in the sample. This is what we call tunneling. It, tunneling is a quantum mechanical event as if the electron had tunneled its way through what otherwise would be a barrier that it couldn't possibly pass. Classically, there should be no way that that electron can make it from the sharp tip to the sample. There's just not enough energy for it to do that. But quantum mechanics says, yes, it is possible. As long as the distance between the tip and the sample is reasonably small, there is a finite chance, it may not be a very big probability, but there is a finite chance of the electron actually getting from one to the other and allowing a current to flow. And we can actually use that by building a microscope. We can take our tip and our, um, uh, our metal, let's call it a metal slab in blue here, and we can move the tip across the sample, measuring the current at each point. So if we take this left-hand side, if the tip was simply moving across, the distance would change because of this, in this particular case, this rough surface. So the distance from the tip to the sample would change. And quantum mechanics says the amount of current that flows is very sensitive to how big that distance is. You only have to change that distance by a fraction of an atom, half the uh, diameter of an atom, for instance, only a tiny change to that D will give us a measurable change in the current that's flowing. It's not like it's a tiny effect. A small change in D might make the current go up 10 times, for instance, easily measured. And one option we have is to move the tip across the sample and move the tip up and down so as to keep the current the same. In other words, keep the distance the same. And then you can see that the distance, the locus of points, the travel, if you like, of the tip, then maps out the arrangement on the surface of the material. So this allows us to measure at the scale of atoms and smaller. So if we take this handsome gentleman and what's in the background, let me look at what's in the background. This is the scanning tunneling microscope sealed inside an ultra high vacuum vessel. Ultra high vacuum means a pressure of about 10 to the minus 13 atmospheres. We, we take effectively all the air out of this vacuum equipment in order to keep the sample nice and clean to make sure that the molecules in the air, the water vapor, everything else doesn't get in the way of us measuring the surface we're interested in. It keeps the sample clean. And here's an example taken by a colleague of mine at the University of Manchester. You can see the scale in the bottom left hand corner of about two nanometers. So these individual bumps on the surface are individual atoms that we can resolve because the scanning tunneling microscope is so sensitive to tiny changes in the distance between the tip and the sample that we can measure those e relatively easily with, um, uh, with an ammeter. We can measure the current and we can see the variation in the current telling us what the variation in the height of the surface that we're looking at. And if we're looking at a metal or a semiconductor, the bumps we tend to see 
uh, are individual atoms if the surface is flat enough. If the surface is very rough, we just see the roughness. If the surface is very flat, then what we actually see are individual atoms. So for quite some time now, the, the scanning tunneling microscope was invented back in the 1980s. So for quite a few decades, we've had the capability of microscopy on the spatial scale of order atoms that allow us to see individual molecules or individual atoms on a surface. And it's a fundamentally quantum mechanical process that is allowing us to see those atoms. When we look at uh, materials, we see all sorts of patterns. So this, uh, this picture on the left hand side is actually the arrangement of atoms in a particular metal alloy, which I'm not going to go into. So on a scale of order nanometers or tens of nanometers, we can see white blobs corresponding to particular atoms on the surface. And you perhaps notice that in some cases they appear in little sunflowers of 10, but every so often we also see atoms arranged in pentagons, which is not really what we are expecting. But remember that some crystals arrange themselves into dodecagons with uh, pentagonal faces. And so it is perhaps not surprising that the arrangement of atoms inside this crystal is just what we're showing on the left hand side. Effectively, this picture taken with a scanning tunneling microscope is effectively one of these crystals that has been sliced open and then we're looking at the arrangement of atoms inside and it's no surprise that the pentagon arrangement that we see in the crystal on a scale of about millimeters is reflected in the atomic arrangement that we see if we use a scanning tunneling microscope. Not only that, but if we measure the distance between atoms and look at the ratio between how far apart are these two atoms versus how far apart are these two atoms, it doesn't matter which ones I'm talking about, but if we look at the ratios of distance between atoms, we find that we get a characteristic number out of this particular alloy. It comes out to be that number there, which amazingly enough is the same as the ratio of counting scales on a pineapple if you go one way around the pineapple versus the number of scales on the pineapple if you go the other way. Or another example, which perhaps you've seen, looking at the seed head on a sunflower, if we count how many seeds there are, if we follow one of these spirals in one direction, and we count the number of seeds if we follow the spiral in the other direction, we get this same ratio. So for, for reasons that we are investigating, this is what a lot of people are doing in, in research in condensed matter, is looking at what's going on at the scale of atoms. And in some cases, can we tie that in? And can we understand the relationship between what's going on on the scale of the very, very small, on nanometers and tens of nanometers, versus what's going on on scales for which we can have a much uh, more common sense approach to, well, we can measure what's going on in a sunflower or in a pineapple. Can we understand those to the extent that we can understand why atoms arrange themselves the way they do on a scale which is clearly millions of times smaller? This is a, another scanning tunneling microscope, but this is now a corral in the sense that atoms have been placed. Not only can a scanning tunneling microscope take images of where atoms are through a process I'm not going to describe, it's also possible to move atoms around on a surface. So you can actually construct, if you like, arrangements of atoms on a surface, much the same way of moving Lego bricks around on a, on a baseboard. In this particular case, a whole ring of atoms has been made and you notice that what's inside looks much more like a wave of what happens if you were to throw uh, a stone into a mill pond, you would expect to get waves rippling out. So it looks like the, whatever's going on in here is behaving much more like a wave than it is these objects here which appear to be behaving like particles. So in this one image, we're encapsulating the fact that matter sometimes behaves as a collection of particles and sometimes behaves like a collection of waves. This one image encapsulates both very nicely. And it just reminds us that quantum mechanics is always going to be rather difficult to interpret. A quote that always comes out whenever any university lecturer starts to try and teach quantum mechanics to his students, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it. Anybody that thinks they understand quantum mechanics and are happy with quantum mechanics is probably kidding themselves. <laughs>
even the people that have spent decades of their lives studying quantum mechanics still don't claim to understand what it is that's going on. Quantum mechanics, you can argue, is a set of tools. It's a toolbox that allows us to say what would happen if we have this atom doing this and this atom doing that, and what happens if we try and make this molecule, what would we expect for the properties of the material we've just put together? Quantum mechanics is a toolbox that allows us to predict what's going to happen. It works fantastically well as a toolbox. It's exceedingly difficult to figure out what it is actually telling us about the nature of matter on the scale of the very, very small. Einstein threw us a bone and said, one of the most incomprehensible things about the world is that it is comprehensible. In other words, it doesn't matter how bizarre the theory is, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about general relativity and black holes or whether you're talking about quantum mechanics and atoms. The world is complex, but it is not incomprehensible. It is possible to make sense of the world if we have the right level of imagination and knowledge, and Einstein would argue that imagination is actually far more important than knowledge, if we, if we have the right level of imagination, it is possible to make sense of the world. At the moment, we're still wrestling with quantum mechanics. Maybe one day it'll be a little easier. It is working as a theory, but it's just a little difficult to figure out what it all means. I'll finish with this picture, which is one I really like. This is an image of uh, carbon. This is individual carbon atoms. Notice the scale on the bottom here, 850 picometers. A picometer is one thousandth of a nanometer, which is one thousandth of a micron, which is one thousandth of a millimeter. So this image in its entirety is smaller than one nanometer, which is 10 to the minus nine meters. If we imagine that picture in front of us, probably on your computer screen or your laptop at the moment, if we imagine that that is representative of the distance between atoms, then on this scale, a grain of sand would be about the size of our moon. So that, again, makes you think whenever you're looking at a microscope image at individual atoms, it reminds us that we're looking inside a world. If we imagine the world as a grain of sand, William Blake to see a world in a grain of sand. If we imagine the world as a grain of sand, then the STM allows us to go inside and see what's going on at the microscopic level. So I'll finish with William Blake to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Thank you all very much for your attention.